right, everyone. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us in this iteration of our lunchtime lecture series here at Saddleback College. My name is Steve Rosa. I'm dance faculty here on campus, and I'm joined today by Eric Galindo, writer, producer, director, overall amazing human being. Um, <laughs> I'll let uh, him introduce himself oh, as he can do. He, he could do himself more justice than I can. So, Eric, yeah, if you could just introduce yourself, say a couple things, and then we'll get going. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I yeah, I, I I write and produce um, podcasts and television and film. I'm currently um, actively closing two shows, wrapping up production on two podcasts. One of them is called Out of the Shadows, which is about the 1986 Amnesty Bill, and another one is called Snooze, where um, we help people who have been putting something off, uh, we help them complete it. And those are the current active projects, but I'm also in the process of writing a movie and writing a TV show for CBS. So a lot going on. Thank you for having me. I love Steve. Steve is the best. <laughs> yeah, Eric, Eric and I go way, way back. Um, yeah, so the reason why I wanted to reach out to you and bring you into this series is because I feel like your work you know, because I've known you for, for quite a long time now, but just to like personally see how your work has really shifted, right? Like your, the arc of your work, you as an artist, you as a collaborator and the different um, modalities in which you're working, right? So the first podcast to my knowledge that you did was Wild, correct? Right, and, and so for me, Wild, just it was, it was something that was so relatable and so needed in the time. Um, can you speak a little more to the Wild podcast and how that came came up? Yeah, Wild was a podcast. Um, it was my first podcast. Um, I had done before that. I had done a lot of documentary work and a lot of uh, print journalism, um, and then also some reporting for an NPR station here in Los Angeles. And then um, I was given this opportunity to do a podcast. And they wanted me to do a podcast about um like the multiple crises that our generation has felt you know um and just kind of broadly speaking like what it's like to have your life turned upside down because it's something that i always like write about and and talk about um sorry my dogs are just in the background no. <laughs> you're fine that's one of the the beauties of zoom right we always get right. the background stuff um, and, and, you know, we decided to make it about, instead of focusing on so much on like the, the problems, we wanted to talk about like people who have transformed these, these like, you know, transformed these seemingly over insurmountable obstacles mm -hmm. and specifically focusing on what it was like to be home during the pandemic. <clears throat> and the whole series is basically like, I welcome our listeners into my home and then I bring in guests who tell us stories about their transformative experiences, their origin stories, as we're kind of like chilling at my house, quote unquote, and you know, at, at the end of wild, you finally get to like, hear my story of the pandemic. So it's like 10 stories from the pandemic, all people of color, um, people from marginalized communities um because you know i want to tell those those stories specifically because they often don't get a lot of uh play especially you know during the pandemic most of the stories focusing on people of color were um as stories of victims which are important stories and I'm, I'm glad they're being told but i wanted to tell positive uplifting um stories um because i do think you know Oftentimes people are like, millennials have it bad. They have this and that and that. And I'm just like, I think every generation goes through hardships. And, you know, like, I don't know if like that's something special to focus on. And instead, let's focus on the, the great work people are doing. So that was kind of the like the impotence of Wild and how we like were able to do it. And you actually helped me do my album cover for uh, wild which is probably like 
like one of the my favorite things is just the photo, photograph by Marissa Klug Martoya and uh, with Steve Rosa's assistance. Incredible. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so if y'all check out the thumbnail for Wild or like the the <laughs> all the beauty that is Eric's face. Um, you'll see my hand in there. <laughs> so I was Marissa is a good friend of ours and a phenomenal photographer. And so I was directed to hit Eric in the face repeatedly with uh, this bouquet of poppies and other flowers. And it was, yeah, right. it was, <laughs> it yeah. was a great experience. What can I say? Um, we actually <laughs> photographed that in the front yard of my mom's house. That's and, right. uh, and so I, you know, my mom was watching from the window. She was like, wow, you weren't kidding. You were really whacking him with those flowers. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think I hit you in the eye a couple of times. Pull yeah. seat, though. I'm sorry still. No, it's all but, good. I, right? I, I mean, it was so much fun. Yeah. And it was, it's always an honor to be in one of Marissa's crazy, like, photo shoots. Right. Yeah. She, she yeah. does just phenomenal work. Um, but you did speak to something that I think is really important, something that I relate to a lot, which is highlighting the voices of marginalized communities, POC. Um, in a more positive way, taking away the doom and gloom, taking away the the heaviness in which we often hear a narrative surrounding a lot of these communities that we identify within, right? So for me, being Latina, non-binary, queer, like usually the, the way that my communities are presented is very much in that negative light. So listening to Wild was a very empowering experience for me, listening to these different stories that you told within that podcast. And then now I'm up to episode three in um, Out of the Shadows. My God, <laughs> like, there's just so much there. There's so much I didn't know. And I was born in 1986. So like wow. this literally, like it, this has, what you speak about in this podcast, literally, it, it directly relates to me and my life and my upbringing. I'm the youngest of six. Uh, from a uh, Salvadorian family, single parent household, essentially. So my mother, you know, worked day and night, um, owned her own business, raised all six of us essentially by herself. And if it wasn't for everything that you talk about in this podcast, who knows where our lives would have been. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that podcast and specifically what y'all are addressing? Yeah, so um, in 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed this bill called the um, Immigration Reform and Control Act, you know, better known as IRCA or the Amnesty Bill. That bill gave 3 million families in this country um, green cards. You know, these were undocumented families that were living in the shadows, which is a term that is that Reagan himself used that a lot of people used around the time. And um, Out of the Shadows tells the story of the people who um, basically helped lead that fight to get that bill passed. It was a once in a lifetime uh, gigantic re immigration reform bill. Nothing like it happened before and nothing like it happened since. And it actually shifted the, the country in a, in a positive way in many ways because it, it, it created a whole new middle class. It gave people who were working uh, without protections under the table for really low wages, actually a, a, an opportunity to become entrepreneurs, to own their own homes, to get loans, to pay for things. And, and the economy that we see now, which is like often supported by these people, by the by immigrants and their children was a direct result of that. And and the other thing it did was it also created a, a, a massive backlash, an anti-immigrant backlash, which is why you see those divisions now. And we're telling the story of this moment, um, like why Ronald Reagan signed this bill, who were the people that fought to get it passed. But, but a lot of it is also telling the story of like, what brought our parents here in the first place? Um, and that's something we really don't really ask because we always just assume like, oh, they came to America because America is the best, right? But that's just like a narrative that they, that, that America itself, American, you know, government has per perpetrated for, perpetrated for a long time. In, in true reality, it's like they were exploiting our parents from the beginning and, and, you know, like your family's from El Salvador, like, 
the Reagan administration used El Salvador and Central America as a like battlefield to fight communism and directly created the conditions for people to have to flee their home country. And then, you know, like all of that is all interwoven and interconnected and like that's part of the story but the other part is that it's a love letter to our parents who like did incredible things and their stories are often not told in that way and, and definitely not told by them you know it's always like someone else telling the story in this case you know we're interviewing our own parents we're interviewing other people's parents um and we're interviewing their kids like about what what it was like to grow up in the 80s and what it was like to benefit directly from this amnesty bill um we're talking to psychologists like everybody to try to understand the moment and we're telling the story over um 10 episodes um and it's through iheart um and it's it's been it's been cool to like really investigate the circumstances of these moments and really like um talk to people like 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 the crazy thing is like people don't know this but immigration used to be not it was like a it was like a conversation people would have but it wasn't like the third rail that it is now it wasn't like this polarizing thing it was like people would come and go there was no ice there was no like the 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 raids the migra raids the ice raids there wasn't even ice didn't even exist back then but it was it was called ins and they didn't really pick up until like the uh late 70s early 80s but prior to that the relationship this country had with immigrants was much much different and there's it's just um been interesting to explore and examine the the era yeah one of the really beautiful things about that series so far like i said i think i'm on episode three right now is that what's been released up to this point is up, up to episode three maybe we're gonna do we're, we've dropped five so far oh, okay so yeah, I, just, I just have stopped. some catching up to do yeah but um yeah so hearing the stories told by our elders by our parents right i think that's a thing that's for me very compelling because i'm used to hearing my mom's stories right what, you know what, whatever she's willing to share with me and i've noticed that the older i get the more she peels back and the more she discloses when i was younger she would just say oh i came from inside of and it was hard and then as i got older i found out that she uh came over and was a month pregnant and had no idea and that she lived on the streets and that she was a victim of police brutality with a baby bump that she would eat out of trash cans that if it wasn't for one particular family who took her in as a as a caregiver to take care of the, their kids their two little kids um who knows where my mother would be at this point oh. because she couldn't get employment through agencies she couldn't do things like that because she she struggled with language she had her baby bump and she had nowhere to go her one family member who brought her over or who said that you know she could crash with them, which was a cousin, uh, kicked her out after a week, and so my mom had nowhere to go. Right. So like I and so in your podcast, like hearing these other stories, they feel so real and they feel so relatable because it feels like an elder within the community speaking, and it's just just to hear it straight from them is so powerful. Though you mentioned the raids, I remember when I was a kid with my mom at work. So my family business is catering trucks, loncheras, right? And so I would always, anytime I could, um, I'm my mom's chicle, right? Like just stuck to her like gum when I was a kid, especially. So uh, I would always go to work with her and we would sell food at different factories. Um, before, the, before the gourmet food truck craze and boom, lonchera business was you would have a set route and it's still like this. And you would go sell at the same warehouses or the same places on a schedule every day. And I remember one of her stops, one of the places we would go to was a um, a fabrica, a factory where they made Halloween costumes and they did like curtains and they did different things and changed with the seasons. And we go one day and it's empty. And, wow. and so my mom's like, what's going up? So like we go, we open the doors, we set up, we're ready and it's just empty. There's no one there. And so my mom gets off and pokes around 
we later found out there was a rave the day before, right after we left. And uh, yeah, they, they pretty much took everyone and, yeah. and that was that, right? So you have these moments, like I completely forgot about that moment. Absolutely forgot, I was, I was a kid. I was probably, I don't know, eight maybe? I was I was a little one, right? Um, and I completely forgot about that moment. But after, while listening to this podcast, it came back so vividly to the point where I could even remember like the smells of like the plancha in the catering truck, right? Like it was just such a visceral experience. So I think that's one of the beautiful things in which the in how you tell your stories is that it really compels for folks that relate to it. At least that's all I can speak to such a, a a sensory response and it's it just it's so thought provoking and it's done with so much tact and like grace and realness that's the thing it's so real like wild is so real out of the shadows is so real i haven't had a chance to listen to snooze yet um i know you've been working on that one is can you talk a little more to that one as well yeah so snooze actually i'm so snooze i'm the showrunner um i you know i help with the writing and the editing and i run the production but it's actually hosted by megan tan who was one of the um uh co-creators on on wild and if you listen to wild she was in the uh, love episode the episode seven which was very popular and so she has this mission to like help other people and so we she created this idea for a show where she actually does that and um what we do is people uh we create a hotline people call into this hotline and they say um i've been putting off like we had a woman who hadn't gotten her license she's 30 30 something years old never got in a license she'd been putting it off she'd been wanting to do it but had been putting it off for so many years because she grew up in new york right so she didn't need a car, but then she moved to LA and then she wanted a car and then all these circumstances. And, and that's kind of how life goes, right? Like you start to put things off and then she, so Megan created this show and put together this team and we help them. We like coach them, we cheer them on. If they need like a, a lesson, a driving lesson or something, like we try to help them find someone that can help them and we also bring in like celebrities to give us advice um you know like we have rosario dawson come in big boy from outcast atsuko katsuko margaret cho like they come and they and they give their wisdom um that we can and then impart to the people that we're helping overcome these obstacles we have um a, a person who hadn't finished a song a singer who hadn't finished a song in like three years who found who like came to us for help. We have a person who had been putting off applying to Drew, Drew, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race for many <laughs> years. And they are they came to us for help. And we have someone who's looking for a sex therapist and then putting that off. And, and so like the things can be really small. Like one woman had been putting off reading a book and they can be big, you know, like a sex therapist is a big kind of step, you know. But there, but the show is really more about like people. I feel like you know one thing that a lot of us don't really understand that maybe we'd need is like we need a cheer squad. We need people in your corner. We need people to hype you up. We need people to tell you, "Hey, it's okay. Get up and do it again when you fail." And this show does that for people, you know, and it also gives the listeners tools so that maybe they can help themselves or they can help others um, or even ask for help. So that's that's what the show is. We, we in real time sort of chronicle that person's journey, almost like a reality show where we're like doing voice memos and we're interviewing them and we're, and we're like recording the things that they are doing. And it's really dope. It, it's, it's super inspirational to, to like help someone else like personally as like a producer on the show i have coached people like in in their low moments and just kind of talk to them and and that has been super um inspirational to see them like rise above their own blocks you know because a lot of our blocks are like super internalized right like 
they they are impacted by the environment around us and the things that are happening but a lot of times like when we put shit off it's like oh like i don't i can't even do that right now my brain just can't get there and so you just need someone to be like yo you can do that and this is here's here's one way you can do it you know and so that's what snooze is about and um it just launched it's like we've only dropped a couple episodes but um it's been getting a good res- good response like people really are like feeling inspired by it yeah I, you mentioned something that i think is really important this idea of like you know having your cheerleaders your support system your the the folks around you that are going to prop you up or that are going to push you forward and i think that's something that a lot of uh, folks have maybe been a little more introspective about in the pandemic right self care is a big thing now it's a very yeah. common phrase and so i think in the pandemic a lot of us have really figured out who is that support system who are your leaders who are the folks that are going to prop us up so in other words comunidad right community. exactly yeah. yeah so like who is our community who are the ones that we can have conversations with get yeah. challenged by get um inspired by hence totally. why hence why i asked you to join us today exactly <laughs> no, because, no, yeah. it's true yeah. that's a great point yeah this yeah. is the, this is the time to find your 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 community you know yeah yeah and i mean you know for me the one common um aspect of you know just the, the podcast not even including your other work is this idea of like community you bring um you know folks that sound back might be tired of me saying community but it's so important to me it's a big part of my culture right like it's just i think it's a big part of success and it's the only way we can really thrive um personally and professionally and so i feel when on your podcast you are highlighting different aspects of what it is to be a part of a community or building a community um in wild and out of the shadows and in snooze right so in such different um approaches too which i think is amazing um i want to transition now and have you talk a little bit about the shows that you've been writing and just you know talk about that experience and what the shows are and what the the content of your shows are for sure you know that's uh, i'm glad you brought up community cuz you know one of the things that like i do my, all my work is mission driven work you know it's mm-hmm. all about um uplifting my community and humanizing my community the people that i grew up with i grew up with and i grew up in southeast los angeles surrounded by black and brown people by uh immigrant communities by you know and and all my friends came from marginalized groups you know um lgbt non binary like all of those people were like that was my community these were the people that i grew up with and um you know what you see a lot of, a lot in the hate that exists in a in in the public space for marginalized people i think comes from a lack of empathy and a lack of the fact that our stories are 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 never told and we are not humanized you know and so i spent a lot of my early career like angry and fighting with anger you know and like marching and and like voting and like all these things that they you know that are very important things but i realized at some point that you know the things that i that convince me so often uh, to like change my perspective were stories you know um and like i grew up thinking i was like wanting to be a thug and then i read always running by lisa rodriguez and realized like oh man we're all stupid like this is dumb. <laughs> we don't value our lives and that's why we're killing each other you know and and so i you know when i when i came to that realization i was like i really want to tell a story like i want to i want to change this at least how i perceive the world as a place where there's not a lot of empathy for people of color especially um and you know like i said the communities that i grew up in And so when I do tell stories, every story comes from that perspective, including my um the stuff I do for TV and film, which is like, you know, the the show that I'm working on um over at CBS is called The Mexican Beverly Hills. It's 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 based on an essay I wrote for the New York Times about my life um uh, moving from like the Compton Paramount border like that area to Downey, which is Downey 
is this um, suburban middle class neighborhood that also happens to be like predominantly Latino. And when people think of predominantly Latino neighborhoods, they often think about poverty or they think about crime. And Downey actually is an aspirational place, you know, and, but the transition was not easy to come from like a place, a, like to come from the hood to Downey is always a culture shock. Um, and every, and the thing is everybody that comes to Downey basically goes to that, you know? Um, I did. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah it's like because it's because it is it's like oh it's supposed to be this like latino shangri-la but then you get here and you're like oh i feel even more out of place among my people because it's about because the truth is like latinos are not a monolith and latinos and and a lot of this is class right that we're talking about so you know that's basically the show that i'm writing is about you know that culture, that culture clash, and what does it mean to to inherit generational wealth, and what does it mean to to like prop, like build yourself, like your mom's story, right? Like that she came from nothing, and uh, now is an entrepreneur who built a home for her family in one of the like most expensive cities in LA, and like how did how did that what is that story like that's an inspirational story and i think that that's the kind of stories that, that i like to tell so that's um the show that i'm working on right now and trying to get that um produced over at cbs um yeah and, and things like that you know like you know the stuff i like to write about is like again stuff that gives people a very specific story from the Latin American diaspora, you know, because to me, specificity is the most universal connector. Like when someone tells you a very specific story, you feel more connected to it and more seen than if they were trying to tell you a story that you related to, right? So like the fact that for the longest time, whenever they try to tell, you know, and I'm gonna speak specifically about me, stories from like the Latin American diaspora or the Mexican American diaspora, they try too hard to tell everyone's story and the story gets watered down, you know? Um, and I think when stories are truly powerful, they're very super specific, you know? And like, I'll bring up like real women have curves, right? Which is an epic, like, movie that tells a story of a young woman coming of age while trying to navigate what it's like working as a seamstress for her for her mom who is like this old school very judgmental um like about the woman her daughter's body right and like that's so specific but that's also one of the best movies that has resonated with so many people like that story like on the surface, like how, like me as like a redheaded Mexican kid, like man, like why does that story connect with me? Because it's, because the the themes are universal, but the, the, the characters are so specific and they feel like people you know. And so that's kind of um, my approach to storytelling. And it, it, it you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new medium for me to like break into, but I, but I am, basically trying to do the same things that I've done, you know, at the New York Times, at the LA Times and podcasting, but now in, the, in a different medium, trying to just, you know, again, trying to achieve that mission of telling stories about my community. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's beautiful. It's interesting you bring up that film. I was actually thinking about it not so long ago. Cause it's one of the first times when like me watching, yeah, when did that come out? That's like a, yeah, I don't, like, we, we, we were kids, I feel. <laughs> Wait. High school maybe? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think we're in high school at the time. But um, yeah, I was, it was one of the, I've always been a thicker person. And mm -hmm. so seeing that film, I was like, I am, I can be sick and beautiful. Right. And you know, yeah. I've done a lot of work now. I mean, so in, in my field in dance, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, talks around body 
and like the old school way of like a dancing body and how a body should exist within certain dance spaces. And so a lot of us as educators are breaking that and changing that and recognizing that all bodies are dancing bodies. You know, all abilities can move, they can engage in like this kinetic exchange. Mm -hmm. And um, for myself personally, you know, being a bigger person, it took a lot of work to work through, um, you know, acknowledging and recognizing that my body is valuable and worth it and stunning. And then reflecting back on like that film and other moments in like my upbringing where, you know, it's been like, no, people have been so judgmental of my physical form, but also where I've seen very few moments like in that film of like the thicker body being held in a positive light. Now mm-hmm. things have shifted because of content creators um, on social media and also uh, like folks like you who are highlighting voices of folks that are different in a positive way, right? So that like theme again, which I think is so valuable. Um, you mentioned you were working on a film, right? Can yeah, you talk to yeah. that at all? Yeah. Yeah, I just, it's a project. Um, it's a Christmas movie. It's, um, it's about a, like, again, thematically to me, it's a movie about um how sometimes we think the best way to to survive is to be very uh, independent and um you know this film sort of tackles that question like is that true you know is that really the thing like is independence the you know like because it's so it's such an american thing right like pull myself up from my bootstraps i did it all by myself (laughs) whatever you know but like truly, I think that most of us have a, a community, you know, we have a family, we have like, whether it's like a, a chosen family or like a, you know, biological one, like that term can mean anything, but I mean like, so the film is a is a holiday, it's about a family who gets together on Christmas and they sort of um, have to learn this lesson, you know, and it's really about a mother and a daughter who are going through through this issue um and i'm i'm writing the film with my um my partner on out of the shadows patty rodriguez who um is my co-creator and my my business partner and yeah so that that's broadly what it's about like i, I can't really get too much into specifics but it's you know essentially a, it's um do you ever play white elephant yeah yeah, so like the the premise of the movie is like uh, a matriarch, Rose Klug, as, <laughs> as the the main character, and she is um, a badass, incredible businesswoman, entrepreneur, like, but is a little hard, uh, like of a hard a hard ass. And she's turned White Elephant into a super competitive war of attrition that, like, most of her family hates but cannot help to participate in the in the competition. And so White Elephant, if people don't know, is a game where you bring a gift to, to a gift to a party and then everybody starts to open the gifts. They draw numbers. You open the gift. And if you don't like that gift, you can you can trade it for for another wrapped gift with the idea that maybe it's a better gift. And that goes on like until all the gifts are opened. And in this movie, like they the goal is to make to bring the most creative, uh, most desirable gift because to win White Elephant you have to be the gift that got the most swaps right and that is the the show the movie and it's basically just like almost like cards against humanity you know like like because you're trying to guess what like your what everyone's gonna want like what the car like you know you're like if i because you can bring like something simple like a laptop and be like everyone's gonna want this laptop but what if someone brings like you know like uh, i've seen like white elephant games where people bring like um like things they made at home and it's like uh like a bar that every time you 
get a like dispense a beer it plays um you know dragos amargos you know mm. like <laughs> And it's like homemade, like people take it to the next level, right? And that's what this movie is about. It's like people who are very creative, take it into the next level, trying to come up with the best gift. But also like how the competitive nature of Christmas sort of kind of dilutes the whole like family part of it and the bonding part of it. And so it's kind of, it's a, it's a comedy with with some elements of like, you know, classic family christmas drama you know yeah yeah and it, it's we're we're hoping to have uh have it start shooting like in the fall wow um, sorry <laughs> you got a little fly flying around okay <laughs> no, it's just the the light started flickering and I had like a LAPD flashback. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. What is that light? That's a lot right there. That's heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the movie and it, it's good. You know, it, it's been fun to work on it with Patty and we're trying to finalize the final script uh, soon because they really want to start filming shortly that's phenomenal like if i mean we're gonna like wrap it up in a bit but if you can just talk a little to you know one of the main things we talked about when trying to get this series up is you know thinking of artists who work in like different in different ways and approach their their creativity and you know whether that be with uh, film or writing photography movement whatever interdisciplinary work and so could you talk just a little more about I mean, you've published, right? You've done a lot. We we barely scratch the surface of what is Eric Galindo, right? Because we only have like less than an hour. But <laughs> can you talk a little bit as like an artist or yourself as a writer, how it's been working, you know, on podcasts and on shows and on this film? Do you feel like it's similar each time you approach when you're when you're creating content, or do you feel like you really have to switch hats and change how you're getting stuff down? And putting it out there yeah that's an excellent question i think you know i think that there are some basic elements like for me it's all storytelling um and you know when i was like i remember in college i had a lot of interest you know and people kept asking like i'd go to apply for an internship and they'd ask me like well what are you really interested in? and i'm like i want all of it you know um like because to me it's it's more like the fun part is using the medium to tell a story like even dance is story right oh yeah like and so to me it's more like well what are the mediums well, how can i how can i tell a story with the medium so to me the the part about telling a story is the most fundamental part of it but yeah there is like your mind does change and like you know you start to think about things like um your your brain starts to think about practical things right like for a podcast you want to know like how, the quality of the sound right like you start to think about like the fact that people aren't going to be able to see anything so how do you guide them in a way that that you you might not have to do with the visual medium right um and then also with like visuals you start to think about like, oh, okay, well, I can't just be talking, right? Like I have to show, I have to build, I have to world build, right? <clears throat> and then in, in, in all of it for me, in my process, it all starts with writing, you know? So it's really just kind of like your brain starts to, to, to fun, put on, you start to put on different hats in terms of like the production, right? Like if I was just going to write a book or an essay, then that part of my brain doesn't really come on. You know, I'm not like, well, we're going to have to go record this this interview. We're going to have to go collect tape, which we do for audio, or we're going to have to like film this thing, you know, which involves building sets, which like you start to think like, well, I have this really funny idea for a scene that takes place in this really elaborate set that they're only going to use one time. Is that realistic? You know, yeah. so those are little things 
your brain starts to turn on and off. But in terms of like the 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 basic structure of story, like for me, it really helps to me to have um like fundamental rules for myself. And so like what are the stories that I'm telling and how and and it's it's so it sounds overly simple, but like it has to have a beginning, middle, and end for me. Uh, um, and those beginning, middle, and ends par end parts have to hit. Like you know, we call them beats, right? The beats have to hit so that you feel them, you know. Yeah. And and that helps because it grounds me, no matter what the medium is, and also no matter how experimental I can get with the medium. I'm always like, but I have to hit these three beats, which is, you know, the opening scene, you know, the midpoint, um, and then the final scene, right? And these three things all exist in, in most of my work. And that, that has helped keep me from like completely losing my mind because what starts to happen is you realize is there are infinite options when it comes to telling a story or probably anything, right? But like, there are so many options. It's like for me going to the store and there's like 40 different types of um, toothpaste, right? That is that, that can become overwhelming for me. But if I know like, you know, the two don't, no matter what, I'm only gonna use Colgate, for example, is now like a guerrilla marketing ad for Colgate, but <laughs> then I could just play within that. I'm like, I might use the like extra straight whitening. I might use the like, you know, the the sensitive one, you know, but that helps narrow shit down for me. And so that that is for the same thing for story. Like for me going through like specifically like adhering to a kind of like Rasquache version of Joseph Campbell's um, Hero's Journey. Um, like that helps me be like, oh, okay, th these are the beats that are missing. And also when things aren't working and I'm like, oh, this isn't feeling right. I can go back to the, to this very simple structure of like, where are the beats? And that, that applies to everything that I do, including writing essays or, or books or podcast scripts or tv scripts or movie scripts and that helps when you're moving back and forth between mediums mm -hmm. yeah i think that's something that as artists we may have you know our own personal experiences with right getting inundated with inspiration and information and mm -hmm. easily being like spread thin and being scattered everywhere when you were talking <laughs> i think of that scene in the simpsons with mr burns when he's like ketchup 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 <laughs> and he's like i'm in way over my head right so, <laughs> but i've definitely as as a choreographer as a dancer as a collaborating artist with folks i've definitely had those moments where i'm like reel it in like go back just focus on this one thing um you know where i recently did a uh, a music video and i was a projection artist and and did video design for it and we did this really cool thing of doing like um a live stream or real time projection of the vocalist. So I captured her face and her body and then we projected that back on herself. Wow. So there was because of technology, there was like this delay. And I had all these ideas of like all these things that I can do and referring to artists and I was like, just bring it back to what you're working on in the moment. Right. So right. I think that's that's a very um, profound thing. And I, it's a very interesting to hear how you use that in your process when approaching all these different ways of like creating content and writing um the last thing i want to ask is if you have any kind of advice for anyone listening or anyone watching and so if they're interested in getting into you know starting a podcast or writing in general like you know whether it's something for school or, or creative writing on their own or if they're interested in screenwriting or submitting work if there's any nuggets of advice you can offer folks who are listening in um i think you if yeah, if you have anything for that. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things I like to tell um, like people who are trying to get into the business is like, or, you know, in the creative world in general, which is like, I hope, I wish I could go back in time and really just tell myself to enjoy the process, mm -hmm. like to learn to love the process of making a story or creating a world, building, like, because, 
if you're only focusing on results, you're going to be disappointed 90% of the time, right? Like I like to say Kobe Bryant shot more shots than anyone in the NBA history. He also missed more shots than anyone in NBA history, right? But he became a Hall of Famer, right? Um, because it wasn't really about the results. He kept shooting the shots because what he loved was shooting the basketball, you know? Um, and that translated to a, like, very successful career. And and for me, like, I, you know, this is – the creative world is hard and it's filled with rejection. And even when you don't get rejected and you put all your life into, like, something that something becomes a moment and moments are fleeting so for me it's like focusing on all the things that i love to do which is i love to like figure out a story i like to write i like to collaborate with people and like talk about the creative process of a story and like these moments that are i've like they are the journey that makes like everything I do worth it, you know, so I so I don't necessarily have to worry about whether the shot is going to go in or whether people are going to love the show or whether it's going to get high ratings or whether someone's going to publish it or whether someone's going to hire me, because what I wound up doing was having a lot of fun making the thing, you know, and so that's kind of where I would you know, my advice for sure is twofold. Take as many shots as possible. Do not be afraid to shoot up the ball, even if you miss the last 15 times. Because especially in my business, like I've missed way more than I've hit. You know, if you see like five of my projects, there's a hundred that just died on, on like arrival, right? And Thankfully, because I've learned to enjoy making those projects, they don't feel like a waste. And because I've learned to enjoy making the projects that do make it into the world, I am not swayed by whether they do well or whether um, they even uh, like, the fact that they exist is incredible. But to me, it's more like I had so much fun making them. You know, I remember listening to this interview with Paul Thomas Anderson, where he was just lamenting how he spent like an entire five years working on a project. And at the end of the, of the day, all he's left with is like this reel of film. You know, and if you focus on just results, then you're only going to be left with like a reel of film. But if you focus on like, yo, for five years, I got to like have fun and make this world. And oh my God, I got to work with Daniel Day-Lewis. And like, you know, that part is something you can like really hold on to. That's not like, that doesn't feel like this ephemeral like object, you know, or a moment. Yeah, I it's I love that you mentioned that because that's exactly how I work as well. Interesting. We've never had this conversation before. Right. But you know, you think of movement, you think of dance, you think of choreography. Um, it's very much that. It is beyond fleeting. Like we have a concert, like if we speak academically, we rehearse six to I don't know, ten weeks maybe. And then we're on stage, we have tech rehearsal, the concert's done after three days. It's done. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and you will never have that process again with those same dancers with um, in the same space, things will change. Even if you reset the choreographic work, it will never be the same. And that's something I really like focused in on when I was doing, when I was in, at UCLA in undergrad, creating like uh, these photographic works that were based on like movement and body. I don't do work, um, none of my work, it's all like one-offs. You can't really reproduce them. It's a lot of abstract work but it's more about the process versus like the end result. So I feel you there. That resonates profoundly with me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Dancing is beautiful and you're right. It's like one of those things you have to experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember I was with Marisa and um, we were in Befe, um, Ciudad de Mexico. And uh, we saw Malia Hernandez. Woo! Seeing that in person, seeing that live, hearing the drums, right? Seeing that work. We, we were just vibrating and we were so 
that ah, it was just such a beautiful exchange to like experience dance in that way. And I will even if I watch her work again in person or live, I will never have that first experience ever again. So right. there's much about that experience and that process, right? So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, is there anything else you want to say before we like wrap up or close up? I want to give you that option. No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I want to um, I want to thank Eric again for joining us and sharing so much about his practice, his life, and also for giving marginalized folks and folks of color space and, and shining a positive light in our communities. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm super grateful. I'm super inspired by you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you, everyone listening in and watching for joining us for uh, our lunchtime lecture series here at Saddleback. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me. Once again, my name is Steve Rosa. My email is srosa at saddleback.edu. Um, you can find me on campus, come to the dance department, or just track me down any other way. Um, thank you again, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.